Okay, welcome folks. Uh, we are continuing our discussion of early modern philosophy uh, by looking at Hobbes. Uh, so there are a couple of ways in which we can discover interesting things about Hobbes uh, this week. Uh, one way we're going to look at Hobbes is in contrast with Descartes. Uh, and then in the next video in this series, uh, I'm going to be talking about Hobbes's views of human equality, uh, which might offer us some alternative approaches that we can consider uh, in contrast uh, to what we've recently seen in the work of de Gournay and Poulain. Uh, but here uh, we're looking at Hobbes's materialist theory of perception. Uh, so we'll notice that quite notably uh, Descartes can be considered a substance dualist. Uh, so Descartes thinks that there are two kinds of things with completely independent existences of one another, and these things are minds and body. Uh, when we talk about body, we just mean material things, right? So Hobbes wants to be a materialist. That's the view that he argues for, and materialism is going to be the view that there's only one kind of thing, and that's material things, or material body, or material substance, we could even say. Uh, so whereas uh, we might say that Descartes thinks that the mind is a thing that's completely separate from the body, uh, Descartes, I mean, uh, Hobbes, pardon me, so Hobbes is going to say that the mind is you know, a way that some material things are sometimes, right? So what is it to have a mind? Well, it's to have certain materials in certain motions, and that's what thinking is. Uh, so that's our plan for today. Uh, we're going to look at his materialist theory of mind, uh, and then we're going to see how that works out into a theory of perception, and uh, we'll draw some brief epistemological conclusions from it. We can find some really interesting contrasts with Descartes in this way. Uh, so one way we can get a grip on how Hobbes thinks like a materialist uh, is to look at a passage. And I'm going to show you a passage uh, from Hobbes' Leviathan. Uh, in this case, it is not um, in this anthology that I'm using uh, these days to teach early modern philosophy. Uh, you know, anthologies will cut things out sometimes. Uh, this is one that I would invite the editors uh, to bring back in for the second edition, uh, which is the introduction of Hobbes's Leviathan. Uh, so I just pulled this passage from, uh, from the web, uh, where you can find a lot of early modern texts uh, freely available. Here's what Hobbes says. I think that this is a fascinating passage. Uh, we'll also notice that in this edition, the spelling is not changed back from early modern English. So if the spelling seems weird, that's because spelling conventions were not fully in place in Hobbes' time. But uh, let's have a look at what Hobbes tells us here. Hobbes says, nature, the art whereby God hath mate, made and governs the world, is by the art of man. And as in many other things, so in this also imitated, that it can make an artificial animal. What's really interesting in this passage is that Hobbes is, in certain ways, undercutting uh, a standard distinction uh, that people made back then and still make nowadays which is the t distinction between that which is natural and that which is artificial, right? We think of God's creation as nature, uh, but if we think about an artificial thing as a thing made by somebody, well, if we say that the world was made by God, well, then we would actually have to say that uh, God, in making the world, has a certain kind of art or artifice. Uh, and what Hobbes is eventually going to argue in his book Leviathan is that uh, human beings, when they imitate the creation of God, can make what he calls the artificial animal. Now, here's where we get into a materialist approach 
to the philosophy of mind, Hobbes says, For seeing that life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within. Why may we say not that all automata, the word automata basically just means like a robot or a machine, right? Uh, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels, asked off, say, a watch, right? So, you know, we might say that there is an internal principle that keeps this watch ticking. Well, might we say that these things have an artificial life? So Hobbes is breaking down the distinction between the natural and the artificial. And he's going to say that the principles of motion that move the watch might be understood in ways that are very similar to the principles of motion uh, that move you and I. So he goes on, for what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer. So God is the artificer of us, right? And it's just like, you know, we create a watch which has some gears and some knobs and some hands in it, um, each of them performing a function. Hobbes is going to suggest that God is also the artificer of us. Right? Now, he goes on to say, art, that is, the work of human beings, goes further, imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature, man. So, just like God is creating things, people are creating things. And we might say, like, look, uh, you could think of God as a very special kind of watchmaker, right? That makes an intricate material thing that partakes in life. And we might say, a well-made watch, <coughs> excuse me, a well-made watch is also going to be a material thing that partakes in certain activities. Now, he then says, for art is created that great leviathan, for by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state. So eventually uh, the leviathan, uh, this text by Hobbes, uh, functions as a piece of political philosophy, saying that the state is a creation of human beings, much like nature is a creation of God. Uh, but we can see here that uh, Hobbes has uh, a particular way of looking at what human life is. And we might even think what human thinking is. Uh, it's not something spiritual or separate from the material natural world, but in fact, it is a special, rationally planned uh, arrangement of matter in motion. Now, here's a lingering issue for Hobbes. Whereas with Descartes, we can find really clear arguments in favor of, for instance, mind-body dualism. I sometimes wonder whether we have a clear uh, argument, uh, you know, a series of premises that are going to logically lead us to a conclusion uh, for materialism. Um, there's been some work among Hobbes scholars to pick out an argument Sometimes these scholars have looked beyond Hobbes' Leviathan, uh, but we might worry that even if you find this particular approach to materialism compelling, um, we still want to make uh, time to stop and wonder, is there an argument for this materialism? Some have suggested that maybe what Hobbes is doing is saying, look, here is a materialist picture of the mind. It seems plausible to me, and here's how I'm going to explain how a materialist picture of the mind uh, can work and function and explain all the things that need explaining. Uh, we would think of that as a long inductive argument in favor of a materialist view of the mind and human life. Uh, but it's not a simple premise, premise, conclusion argument that's going to demonstrate the truth of the view in the way that Descartes was trying to give a step-by-step -step perfect demonstration that is a logical proof that uh, the mind and the body are separate entities. But uh, if we're going to give this materialist picture uh, a run for its money and see how far we can take it, let's do that. 
So here's how Hobbes is going to think about uh, perception. He's going to say that concerning the thoughts of man, uh, every thought of man is a representation or appearance of some quality or accident of a body without us, which is called an object. So here's the main first thought. When you are thinking about things or when you are having perceptions, basically what these perceptions are is an appearance or a representation, right? So like a picture in your head uh, of some way that the thing is, right? So we might, for instance, pull this coffee mug that I'm drinking from on screen and we might notice, for instance, that it has certain shapes and what am I doing when I sense perceive it? Well, it would seem that uh, the qualities or accidents of this thing without us, when Hobbes says without us, he means like outside our own minds. And it has an effect on my sense organs, which gives me a representation or appearance of some of its qualities. You know, that it has a certain weight or shape or color. So the way that Hobbes is thinking about this, here's the materialist picture. The cause of sense is the external body or object which presseth the organ to each sense either immediately, as in taste or touch. So when I take a sip of coffee, uh, the coffee is literally getting on my tongue. I taste it, and that taste um, is the particular qualities of the coffee coming right into contact with my sense organs. There are also immediate uh, senses. So for instance, I'm not actually touching this coffee mug with my eyeball when I look at it, right? Uh, the visual features of the coffee mug are moving through the air. Uh, you know, they've been illuminated by something else. They're moving through uh, the air towards my eye. Uh, and hitting uh, my retinas and my optic nerve, right? Uh, so that would be immediate sensing. So the materialist, materialistic picture here is that the way that things are are going to make impressions of, say, similar things on your eyes or your organs of touch. Uh, now Hobbes does begin to wonder uh, we might say, like, does the color of a thing make an impression of a similar color in your eye, right? Because there's like a shape of a thing, and then that shape moves through the medium, hits your eye, and then there's a similar shape that gets impressed onto your sense organs. Uh, does that work with colors as well? Uh, is there colorness in an object which then moves uh, from the object through the air into your eye? Hobbes doesn't seem to be committed to that view. Uh, so for instance, he says, perhaps not. So it might be that there is a way that the coffee mug is, but your sense of color, he says it might be what he calls an original fancy caused by pressure by the motion of an external thing. When he's talking about the original fancy, as far as I can understand his usage of this term, is that there is a wholly new thing that comes about in your sensory uh, system uh, caused by an external uh, stimulus, uh, but that there isn't like a one-to-one -one match between the thing and our perception of it. Uh, this harkens back to some of the things that we've already thought about throughout the term, that Descartes seems to think that colors and uh, sensations like hunger are confused perceptions, or Galileo's thought that certain qualities of objects are more in us than in the object itself, right? So Galileo, for instance, argues that tickling, right? That's not a quality of the feather. It's more a power of the feather to trigger a certain feeling in us. And we might often say the same kind of thing about, say, colors. Uh, your sense of color is what he might call the original fancy. So last thing that we might look at, and this is a really helpful contrast uh, between Hobbes and Descartes, uh, is a picture of 
what certain kinds of thoughts are uh, and what the epistemic that is the relation to our ability to have knowledge right so we might say that uh, the epistemology that Hobbes has his theory of when you do and don't have knowledge is quite different from Descartes so first thing he says and this is what you should probably say if you are a materialist about the mind and perception. Your mind is a certain kind of material activity. You're going to say that the imagination is but decaying sense. So things hit you in the sense organs, and then you have a certain perception in your head, which is just a further, uh, further activity of your brain or your sense organs. And when you imagine things, that is sort of like the previous impression of things that have already touched on your sense organs. And then he further goes on to say that dreams are imaginations that occur in sleep. So what is it to have a dream for Hobbes? Well, uh, certain things impact your sense organs. They cause certain things to uh, pop up in your mind. Uh, so for instance, you know, I look at the coffee mug and I peruse its qualities. And then when I close my eyes, I'm no longer being impacted visually by the coffee mug, but I can still sort of picture that lingering sensation of how it looks and feels. That is my imagination at work. Hobbes also points out that uh, when you're sleeping, you're no longer having uh, many sensory perceptions, right? You know, you're in the dark, uh, you're not having changes uh, in the way that your sense of touch uh, is being affected. So when you have a few perceptions, that allows the uh, imagination, that is the lingering perceptions, uh, to reappear. Maybe by analogy, you could think of how in the daylight, you can't see all the stars in the sky, but when there's less sunlight in the sky. Uh, you know, everything quiets down, uh, to mix metaphors a bit. You know, there's less light drowning out um, the light of the other stars. Um, and we might say in a similar way that when you fall asleep, you're no longer getting this barrage of sensory perceptions, and it allows these fainter uh, imaginations to pop up and become perceptible. Now here's an interesting passage. Hobbes considers for a moment the same question that Descartes considers, and that's the question of whether we are dreaming or not. He says this, I consider that in dreams I do not often nor constantly think of the same persons, places, objects, and actions that I do waking, nor remember so long a train of coherent thoughts, dreaming as at other times, and because waking, I often observe the absurdity of dreams, but I never dream the absurdities of my waking thoughts. I am well satisfied that being awake, I know I dream not, though when I dream, I think myself awake. Fascinating passage. Uh, now, in certain ways, uh, the kinds of claims that uh, Hobbes makes here are pretty similar to claims that Descartes makes at the end of Meditation 6. So Descartes, for instance, at the end of Meditation 6, throws out his dreaming doubt and says, look, uh, when I think about how disjointed and incoherent my dreams are, I don't have to treat them as just as real uh, as uh, what I experience in waking life. So in that way, Meditation 6, Descartes and Hobbes uh, are going to be satisfied with a certain line of thought in a similar way. Uh, that, you know, when you are awake and thinking about whether you're awake, you're going to notice um, that your waking days have long trains of coherent thoughts. Right? So if you ask me right now, like, how's your day been going so far? I would tell you, well, I got up, I made some breakfast for me and my spouse. Uh, I went and walked the dog, got a couple of chores done, did some reading, and now I'm making this video. Well, you know, that's like a pretty long, coherent train of thoughts. When you're dreaming, it's often not like that, right? So when you're dreaming, for instance, 
you know, you might be surfing at one moment, and then you are, you know, eating lunch with a celebrity on the other side of the world. Uh, that's absurd. And you don't notice the absurdity of that when you're dreaming. Uh, but when you're awake, uh, you realize that, well, certain kinds of things that you believed while you were dreaming couldn't be happening. And moreover, uh, when we talk about one's waking life, uh, it doesn't involve these strange incoherent jumps, but instead, uh, you know, we have longer, more coherent trains of thoughts, like where you get up and make breakfast and take the dog for a walk, do a little reading, and then record a video. Uh, but uh, we'll also notice this, and I think this is great. Uh, Hobbes points out, I never dream the absurdities of my waking thoughts. So when you're dreaming, you don't think about how, you know, an ordinary day where you walk your dog and get some work done. Well, you never think about how crazy that is. But when you're awake, you think about how impossible what happened in your dreams was. So what's kind of interesting here is that Hobbes is not saying that we have to have absolute perfect certainty against error in the way that Meditation 1 Descartes suggests. So Descartes says, well, once you realize that when you are dreaming, you don't realize you're not dreaming, uh, Descartes seems to think that that should give you pause and make you think that you don't really know that you're not dreaming right now. Hobbes doesn't seem impressed with that argument. He seems to think that uh, the fact that when we are awake, uh, we have a bunch of really good evidence that would establish we are not dreaming uh, when we are in fact awake, that that should be enough uh, to assure ourselves uh, that you know what you are going through right now, uh, I only assume that people who are awake are going to experience this video, not people dreaming. People dreaming won't experience this video. Uh, and that's an, actually enough to know that you are awake and not dreaming. Now, here's one other really fascinating passage. Once we start to think about what dreams are, that might also give us some reason to reinterpret uh, some other people's experiences sometimes. So we'll realize that dreaming is a natural consequence of having impressions uh, that then remain and you know function as this decaying sense in our imagination. Uh, but sometimes people will tell you things like, I once had a vision uh, as I was retiring for the night, a, an apparition came and told me uh, an important truth. Uh, so he gives the example of uh, Marcus Brutus, uh, I don't know the story perfectly, but we could imagine the apparition coming and telling Marcus Brutus uh, to kill Julius Caesar, that an apparition came uh, to Brutus. Hobbes is going to remark uh, that instead of taking that hypothesis, we might instead understand uh, that vision uh, as not the appearance of an apparition, but instead um, a dream. Uh, that Marcus had. And so the fact that he was having certain experiences, certain thoughts, Hobbes seems to think that your temperament can affect what kinds of dreams you will in fact have, uh, that we should not take as seriously uh, people's claims of specific spiritual visions. Uh, now this is not to say that Hobbes is a denier of religious belief, in fact, there's uh, plenty of evidence, though there is some debate, there's plenty of evidence that Hobbes believed in God and uh, wanted to protect the church. But part of what Hobbes is going to say is that we can't let everybody uh, treat uh, every religious vision as equally plausible. He thinks that we would descend into anarchy if we had to trust every person every time they claimed they had some kind of vision. Well, part of what Hobbes can do with this theory of dreaming 
is to say we've got a good explanation of where these visions sometimes come from. Now this idea of keeping order is going to lead us into our next video. Uh, so this will get us to Hobbes' famous arguments about why we need a state. Uh, but uh, to bring Hobbes into conversation with Poulon and de Gournay, who we've looked at in the class already, we're going to be thinking with a particular eye to Hobbes' theory about human equality. What does it mean and how do we come to believe that uh, humans are the equals of one another? So that's where we'll pick up in the next clip. In any case, thanks for watching this one and for uh, learning a bit with me about Hobbes' materialist theory of uh, perception. Take care.